perception that Germans are white, fair-haired and blue-eyed has never been true and will never be true. It's a myth. People always ask me where I'm from. Like it's not possible to be German and black. From the moment I get up and leave the house in the morning, I'm confronted with racist views, images and stereotypes of black people. As a child, I always wanted to have white skin because I felt bad being black and not being able to blend in and always kind of sticking out of the group and being, you know, different than the rest. I didn't want to be different. I am traveling around Germany to talk with other black people about our experiences with racism. My first stop is Hamburg. That's where I was born and grew up. I had absolutely wonderful parents, and that helped me a lot in difficult situations. I mean, I always had a lot of friends, but I do remember in kindergarten that um, we played these funny games like who's afraid of the black man and 10 little Negroes, it's called in German. So, um, and I remember that sometimes they ran after me and said, Jana Afrikaner, it means something like Jana is an African, Jana is an African. And the problem is that African meant something bad. I first met Sammy Deluxe when I was a teenager in Hamburg. Today he's one of Germany's most successful rappers and hip-hop artists. I've come to see Sammy in a studio. He's had a number of top 10 hits and has sold over a million recordings. Today he also produces other musicians. As a kid, I wanted to be white, and you? Yeah, as a kid, white, and as a teenager, I really wanted to be black. Me too. <laughs> to not have this ambiguity, it seems so clear-cut, like on the white side. White people just knew who they were, black people did too. I felt like I was in the middle. I grew up in a white family, in a white neighborhood. It was definitely a challenge. For me, the feeling of being caught in between is something imposed on you from the outside. I mean, people always say, don't you feel torn, two cultures, black and white, which do you feel more a part of? The fact is, you yourself don't find it unusual. Why should I have to choose? One thing that caused me a fair amount of confusion right from the start was that I have straight hair. And that's why I always felt when I... In grade school, if some kid called me the N-word and I reacted defensively or aggressively, they'd say, hey, you're not really a nigger because your hair is straight. So for me, that was like, okay, I'm dark enough to get called the N-word, but my hair isn't frizzy or curly enough for me to have the right to get upset about it. That was the first contradiction that was imposed on me from the outside. You wrote a song for your son about heroes, didn't you? I wrote the song in 2008. At the time, I was reading a Harry Potter book to my son in the evening at bedtime, and one night he said he wished he were white, because then he could be like his friends, and all he'd have to do is paint that thing on his forehead and wear round glasses, and he'd look like Harry Potter. That made me realize that there's an acute shortage of dark-skinned superheroes. So I wrote this song and made a really nice video to go along with it. 
auch ein sehr schönes Video dazu gedreht. Ein super halbe braune Ich weiß es doch, dass ich... I can remember when I was 13, I was into Nirvana and that's when I started going to parties and the other kids would say, huh, Nirvana, you're black, why are you listening to that? You should be listening to black music. I did and I liked it more. And then there was the black music scene, whatever that means, hip hop and R&B. Nirvana is cool. Und dann in dieser Szene, wo halt And then all of a sudden you as a black person were part of the majority. And there were these positive associations. I think that's one of the main reasons I became who I am. Rap was the first thing that gave me a home court advantage, so to speak. I just had to let my pants hang a little bit lower, pull my cap to the side and move like this. And everyone was into it. It looked authentic and it fit well with my exotic status. I did graffiti, DJing, collected records, started producing, rapping and beatboxing. All the hip-hop disciplines except breakdancing. That was too much work. So you're telling me you're not the sporty type? <laughs> Only with words. As a journalist, I don't have a home court advantage. When I decided to become a journalist and when I became an anchor, I was actually, I think, the first female black anchor in Germany. I didn't have any role models. For me, it's really important that uh, black children, you know, when they switch on the TV, they might see me and think, oh, great, I can be on TV and read the news. And I don't have to have a job which fulfills the racist stereotypes. For me, that would be great if I could help bring down barriers in that sense. Black people have been living in Germany for 400 years. Today, they number about one million. In Cologne, I've come to see Theodor Vonja Michael. He was born in 1925 in Berlin. Why did your father come from Cameroon to Germany back then? Cameroon was a German colony. And just as people used to dream of going to America, at that time many young Africans wanted to come to Germany. There was no such thing as what we now call racism, at least not as we know it today. It only started to take shape when the young Africans started asserting themselves, for instance, by marrying German women. And the reaction was, they're taking away our women. You appeared in ethnographic exhibits, also known as human zoos. What was that like? Imagine human beings being exhibited like objects, literally exhibited, for what they supposedly represented, namely Africa, with vast skirts, drums, dancing and songs. The idea was that people on display were foreign, exotic, and were showing spectators what their homeland was like. Basically, it was just a big show. How crazy is that? You as a German were supposed to imitate this perceived culture of Africa, which is such a huge continent. But I'm a black man, so of course I should be able to do that. That's how it is. It's in my blood. 
Let's talk about the Nazi era. It's so hard to imagine because black people would obviously attract attention in a regime that was so racist. That's right. We didn't need to wear a yellow star. Everyone could see we were aliens. Did you know a lot of other black people in Germany? Oh, sure. Everyone knew everyone. There were so many colonial films made back then. And many of us would meet up as part of the cast. That's me. That's my close-up. I like the fact that they shot a close-up of me. Everyone who was black was in that film. I was 16 at the time, and it struck me. My God, we're all here together. They could take us away without anyone noticing. And that thought weighed very heavily on me. Well, thank God that never came to pass. We were too few in number to matter to the Nazis. And I avoided all contact with white women. That would have been horrible. I would have been sterilized. And I might also have been charged with racial defilement. You say that you took great care not to get too close to white women or girls. Was it like hiding or trying to become invisible? How can we imagine that? Well, that's the right word, invisible. Of course, with a face like this, I could never completely disappear. But I tried. I really did. The main thing was to keep your head down and your mouth shut. I made sure I did that, to the point that I started to stutter. I stuttered terribly. Listening to the difficult, often horrible things you experienced, how did you find the strength to go on? Well, I have to say, with God's help, I became a religious person. That gave me hope. Theodor Wonja Michael always says there's nothing in the German constitution that states what a German is supposed to look like. But some people haven't gotten the message. For them, we are still exotic. When I was a child, complete strangers would touch my hair and say, it feels like a bird's nest. My God, it's good to see you. I watch breakfast TV every morning. I turn on the set and think, an Afro-German woman on German public TV. We're so proud of you. You do such a wonderful job. But dear me, look at your hair. We have to talk about that. Yes, we do. We'll work in some coconut oil. Like many other black men. I have a vision with that dream. Ah, thanks a lot. I love your curls. Yeah? Okay, then I would always wear curls. These are happy curls. 
Now I'm really happy to be talking to Esther Donkor, the founder of Krause Locke or Curly Hair magazine. Sometimes I think that black people's hair is really politicized. It's like a political statement, whether you have your hair done or wear it naturally. The stereotype is that their hair is messy and wild. That doesn't go over well in the professional world. Afro hair just isn't acceptable in our society. It still doesn't comply with our ideals of beauty. Look at Beyoncé. She's a black woman, she's a performer, she's the embodiment of empowerment, but she still wears a straight blonde weave. I've met women who work in law offices and places like that who get into trouble if they wear their hair naturally. Can you tell us about the natural hair movement? I sort of fell into it. It's about allowing people with Afro-textured hair to wear it naturally, without causing a fuss or having to feel self-conscious. That's what life is about, accepting yourself. To feel comfortable in your own skin, that's the goal, but it's not so easy. I think the problem is that if you see all these stereotypes about Africa, about tribes, about being primitive, barbaric, natives, underdeveloped, it hurts you. Part of the problem are the images from the days of colonialism. In Berlin, there are still streets named after German colonies and colonialists. It was here in Berlin in 1884 that European nations held a conference where they carved up Africa into colonies. I'm here at a street festival aimed at forcing the city to change the name from Mohrenstraße. Here was Joshua Crazy Akins, political scientist and activist. Why is it so important for you to rename the street? The term Moor is one of the oldest German words uh, for black person, but uh, if you we look at the roots of the term, it has the Latin and the Greek roots, Moros and Maros, and yes, that means dark or black, but it also means stupid heathen and primitive. And so we see already in the origin of the word that uh, there is this idea of black inferiority. But then if we look into the history of the street name, we, f we see that the street was named uh, or acquired its name in the context of the Brandenburgian involvement in the transatlantic enslavement enterprise. How would you say does Germany deal with this colonial history? Yeah, I think there's a huge problem. Um, a lot of uh, aspects of German colonial history are not widely known. We can't even begin to understand National Socialism without looking at the colonial antecedents because we find that there are ideological, political, but also personal continuities um, linking German colonialism and National Socialism. Crazy and I set off to uncover some of the traces of colonialism in the German capital. Okay, I think I moved to Berlin 10 years ago, but this is the first time I'm seeing this fresco. Can you explain what I'm yes. seeing? So we had Amela House, and this here uh, shows us the trail of uh, tobacco. Mm -hmm. So you see uh, enslaved African men uh, harvesting tobacco, then uh, enslaved African women packaging the tobacco, then it is sorted and weighed, you know, there's a white overseer, and then it's packaged further, it's made ready for shipment. And you see one of the white overseers is already lounging and having a smoke. Right. But then you see the ship departing for Berlin. And you oh, can yeah. clearly see it's Berlin because you see the silhouette of the German and the French dome. Mm -hmm. So this clearly explains the source of the wealth that was used to build this place. Right? But of course, it also implicates the people that frequented here in the suffering that is also depicted here. Black people are often defined by their skin color. The well-known South African artist Robin Rode plays with these stereotypes. He experienced apartheid in South Africa. Now he's been living in Berlin for 14 years. Hi. <laughs> Good 
to oh, see yeah. you. Good to see you. I can see you're working on a new piece. Yes, um, <laughs> I have a work in process. And it's a work that somehow reminisces about my South African identity. And um, of course, the Afrocomb is a strong symbol. Yeah, it's interesting that you chose hair. Of course, I can identify with that. <laughs> but what does, I mean, what, kind, what role did hair, Afro hair, play for you? Uh, hair became a way to, uh, to classify race. Pencils were placed through hair to, to depict the kind of hair strand and therefore the racial category. So saying that if they go through my hair, they say it's Afro hair, I am exactly. black or probably categorized as colored, as, right? as colored or as mixed race. Um, so if the coal went, went very fine through your hair, you'd be categorized as white. How were you classified in South Africa? I'm classified as colored. I'm classified as a person of mixed race. And so are my parents and so are my grandparents. And um, in many ways, my cultural background is quite complex because I, you know, we don't associate ourselves with uh, black and neither white. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Are you viewed as black? Do you see as black in well, this th German context? Well, I think within the German context, I'm viewed as Arab. Oh, really? So that's <laughs> actually pretty interesting. Uh, I use art as a way to subvert, but also to, to play with and unravel what these kind of cultural labels are. This particular piece, very experimental painting, Everything needs to be defined, everything needs to be categorized. And I'm trying to now explore the notion of something that is completely endless, something that is completely undefined. I was born in 1981 and in the early 90s we had a series of brutal racist attacks here in Germany. In Rostock Lichtenhagen, in Hoyerswerda, in Soling, it was really bad bystanders even clapped during the attacks. It was really heartbreaking to see, and it frightened me so much as a child. And I think there's something that is also very scary if you look at the recent rise in racist attacks on refugees in Germany. And so few of uh, the people who, who, who attacked them were caught and put on trial. And I think that's a really dangerous message to everyone who experienced racism because that means, okay, you can be attacked, but you, you, you can attack people, but you can get away with it. And that, that gives us the message, okay, people can do to you whatever they want. They want be put on trial. And that scares me a lot. Isa Barra is an apprentice roofer working in the eastern German state of Saxony-Anhalt. He hasn't been living here for very long. In 2013, he fled Burkina Faso for Germany. His job gives the 28-year-old some stability. But otherwise, his life is often difficult. Recently, he was beaten up by a right-wing thug. I meet Isa in the town of Burg, where he lives. Also here, Eight Isa, months ago, you were beaten up right here. Tell us about that. I went into the store and saw a man with a woman and child. And he said, look at that, using the N-word, look at this black piece of trash. I didn't say anything. I went to the counter to pay. And he went like this. I said, what do you want from me? And he says, I'll show you. I went over there and he hit me three or four times, like this. How badly were you hurt? I felt a lot of pain in my stomach and I coughed up blood for about a month. 
How does it feel when no one steps in to help you when you're being beaten up and you're often treated with hostility and insulted? How do you cope? I'm always afraid when I go out now. When I go to work, I'm afraid of what might happen along the way. People make gestures like, I'm going to cut your throat. And they shout, go back to where you came from. People do that to me every day. This is the courthouse in the town of Stendal. It's where the man who beat up Isa is on trial. How do you feel knowing you're about to see the person who attacked you? I'm not afraid. I can't wait to see him again and look into his eyes. The attacker, who has a long criminal record, was found guilty of assault and sentenced to 10 months in jail. But he appealed, which is the reason for this hearing. Cameras aren't allowed inside the courtroom. After four hours, the court adjourns. Isa, how was it for you today? I never expected it to go so well. I'm very pleased. The conviction is upheld, but the attacker intends to appeal again. Once you wake up in the morning and you switch on the radio or you switch on the TV, you're confronted with all these stereotypes about Africa. And um, it's really difficult to talk about racism in Germany because once I experienced it, when I talk about racism, people say, oh, you're too emotional, you're overreacting, that can't be true. I'm sure the person didn't mean it that way. So they don't really take it serious. And that is really hard because I feel like I am not taking serious with my experiences. I expose what has been kept quiet as a secret. I expose Racism, without regret, pity, shame, or guilt. And, and listening. The author of this play is the artist and writer Grada Quilomba. She's originally from Portugal, but has lived for many years in Berlin. For me, it took a lot of effort to research black German history. I had to go out because it was nothing that was presented to me in school, for example. What role does silencing play in your art? I, th I think in the last works that I've been doing, I'm very concerned with this question of uh, silencing and speaking, and with the, with the fact that it's not that we have not been producing knowledge or have not been speaking, but we live in a system that constantly silences us or make these knowledges invisible. Racism is really, metaphorically, for me, a ghost that our society never uh, took care of and never cared because we live in this very white narcissistic society that don't want to deal with it. And then she said, well, but for me, you are not black. I don't think that you are black. And she said that in a way as if she was doing me a favor. When did you um, start feeling that no, I don't believe this dominant narratives you just talked about. When did you yes. figure out and said, no, 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 this can't be it. There must be something you, else. Yeah. I don't know if I can tell you, um, but I believe it has always been there. Now, as a mother, I when I am with my children and I hear them uh, uh, bringing the topic of racism, even though they are two and four, uh, 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 five, it just turned five. Um, it is still, I, I, I see that they are aware that it's not right. And it's extremely complicated to explain such a brutal history. 
And this is the trauma of black people and people from many other diasporas who went through similar experiences, collective experiences that you cannot explain and apply any logic to something that is so absolutely lo illogical. I am not aggressive. Angry, because this is aggressive. Yes, I combat. I do not want to be better. Let's now turn to a question that I've heard more times than I can count. How come your parents are white? The answer, my biological father came from Zimbabwe, my biological mother from Germany. Directly after I was born in Hamburg, I was adopted by a German-Swedish couple. And for me, they are my parents. This is Indira Pasch. She too is adopted. I grew up in West Germany. She grew up in the East. We are inside an old guard tower from the days of communist East Germany. A wall divided Berlin until 1989. Indira's biological father is from Guinea. He was studying at the University of Leipzig when he met her biological mother. But she was married and her husband was in jail. Nevertheless, he said he could imagine raising the child. Er wusste aber nicht. But he didn't know that I was going to look the way I look, that I would be a black child. And this man was a hardcore right-winger. He got out of jail soon after I was born. It was obvious that I wasn't a white child. And he tried, he attempted to kill me. My biological mother saw him dangling me out the window, so in all likelihood she said, before the child is killed, I will send her away. And at some point, she decided to put me up for adoption. I think that subconsciously, in any case, you never forget that you were abandoned by your biological parents. You were born and were unwanted. You take that with you to your grave. To me, it still seems unfair to just give away a child like that. Indira works as a dog trainer and has adopted several neglected dogs. How was it for you in play school? One problem was the teachers who thought we shouldn't eat with the other kids. We were supposed to wash our hands really thoroughly, as if something could rub off on the other kids. And we weren't allowed to nap near the other children. My parents did everything to protect us. They gave up everything. They had to be there for us kids. They fought for us. They did what they could, and I think it was the right thing that they moved to East Berlin. You hear so often, oh, adoptive parents can never be the real parents, but that is complete nonsense. You really feel the love they have for their children, just like any other parents. Absolutely. They protect you and do everything for you. You're a family, whether someone gave birth to you or not. Absolutely. For me, blood relationship is meaningless. For me too. For me, it's immaterial. My parents told me about how they drove to the children's home in Leipzig, where I was. And I crawled straight into my papa's arms. For me, it was clear, that's my papa and that's really great. And that's how it was until the end. We were really close. Dass wir so eine enge Verbindung hatten. It wasn't until the age of 17 that Indira met her biological mother. 
dann sind wir halt eine Runde gelaufen. We went for a walk and she said, I didn't want you to turn out so black. That was the very first sentence I heard from my biological mother. Und ähm, dann habe ich gesagt, And I said, ähm, okay, well, what did you expect? <lacht> so. Talking with other Afro-Germans about our experiences gives me strength. That's one reason why I'm a member of the initiative of black people in Germany. Every year they hold an annual meeting. This is the first time I'm attending. Normalerweise war sie, Frau Grötrup, die Chefin der Küche. Und seine Aufgaben waren es, die Post hereinzuholen, die Außentemperatur zu kontrollieren und die Schuhe zu putzen. Author Sharon Dudua Utu is holding a spontaneous reading. Around 270 people have come to the initiative's annual meeting. The group was formed over 30 years ago. Tahir Delas in the steering committee. Tell me, how was the initiative founded? It was thanks to two happy coincidences. The first, Audrey Lord was in Berlin. Who was Audrey Lord? She was an American writer from the black feminist movement in the US. She was teaching in Berlin. Over the course of her time there, she met a lot of black women who came to her readings, but discovered that they didn't know each other. So she hit on the idea of connecting them so that they could exchange experiences. She also brought out what I believe is the first book of stories by black people about black people in Germany. I am a black man. Everyone is welcome to read aloud at the initiative's meeting. When I look at a, at a white man, I mean a really white, white, <laughs> glowing, in the, glowing in the night, white man. The theme of this meeting is empowerment and self-care. What does it mean? Empowerment means showing black people especially young people, that there is a lot they can do themselves, that they can take charge of a lot of things, develop themselves, and establish new perspectives. Self-care, within a society influenced by racism, entails ensuring that you as a black person stay healthy, protect yourself and grow stronger. It's a mixture. It involves politics, but also drinking smoothies or doing yoga or sports. At the Bundesliga soccer club, Schalke, Gerald Asamoa is a legend. Until 2011, he played in the German national team. Okay. A day in the life of Gerald Asamoah. Not bad. Gerald Evin Kostede was the very first black German national player, but you were also one of the first. You started playing for Germany in 2001. How was that? I've heard that Kostede was more half and half. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> Let's just say I was the first really black one. The first black African. It wasn't easy for me back then to decide. I could have played for Ghana. In fact, I had decided to play for Ghana. I was in Ghana, but then they didn't play me. I went back to Germany, and Germany was very insistent. And at some point I said, OK, I'll play for Germany. And that was very rewarding, very interesting. It wasn't easy, but it was nice. What wasn't easy? There are some people, some idiots, who don't want to accept us, and that was my big problem. You can do something for your country, but you're still the black guy. Here's an example. 
After the World Cup in 2006, we came in third, and people accepted us. And then suddenly, a month later, you get booed and called an ape during a match. And that was a moment where I seriously considered no longer playing for Germany. It hurt a hell of a lot. After hanging up his soccer boots, Gerald Assamoa became a youth coach, and today he's the manager of Schalke's under-23s. How was growing up in Ghana? Uh, Are you from Accra? No, no, I'm from Mampong, five hours away from Accra. Mm -hmm. It was a small village where people didn't have much. After school, we'd play soccer with balls made of socks. When I look at my son, he has everything, and he doesn't know what to do with it. I had to struggle to get two square meals a day. That was how I grew up, and it affected me. It made me set goals and say, I have to give my all to achieve something. And that got me where I am. I can no longer understand why, as a child, I wanted to be white. Even if it takes a lot of strength and energy to deal with racism and to hold your head up high, I wouldn't want a different skin color, not for anything in the world. For me, being black means... Are you serious? It means me. That I'm seen differently, but what's going on inside, that's something else. It's nothing more than a skin color. My blackness blooms and becomes my beauty. We're all the same. First and foremost, I'm a person. At my age, I wouldn't want to change anything about who I am. We're people. But I'll tell you one thing. We blacks are pretty cool, don't you think? The rap. Ah.